Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you, whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Ron. I'm Jean Marie. And I'm Lita. Collectively, we are the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we are speaking with Galen Warden. Galen has already cared for three of her six children after life-threatening events plus her father in hospice and her stepmother with advanced Alzheimer's. None of that prepared her for James, her youngest son, getting a severely debilitating chronic illness that doctors did not recognize. Galen's forthcoming memoir will share intimate details of life with severe ME, CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, for her 35-year-old son, who has not left his bed since 2020. Her mission is to shine a light on the harm being done by doctors who claim that ME is psychological and push patients to exercise. She uses social media to support other families facing skeptics and an inhumane lack of support while dealing with severe ME, CFS, long COVID, or other hidden chronic illnesses. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Galen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Galen. This is Ron. Um, I want to start out by asking what events uh, led to your son's diagnosis of, and I'm going to try and pronounce this right, myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome? Yep. Yep. Good job. (laughs) So... So basically, self-diagnosis led to a real diagnosis. He had symptoms for 10 years that doctors didn't understand, recognize, or validate. Uh, He had actually, the the final um, tipping point was when a doctor recommended two weeks in a psychiatric facility to evaluate him. And my son just pleaded with us, I know this is physical. I know this is a real sickness. And he found... ME online by searching his symptoms. And then we searched for an ME specialist. And that's how he got a diagnosis from a real doctor at Mount Sinai in New York. Well, yeah, thank goodness he was advocating for himself. Right, right. And was able to find that. That's right. They have to. Yeah. So I'm glad that uh, he didn't want to go that route. Yeah. Uh, But was there a triggering event? Something that uh, led to the symptoms. yeah. Sometimes the, there's like surgery. You said it's, it was going yeah. on for ten years. I mean, what what was it that he said? Hey, something's wrong. When he was 21, he had his third bout of Epstein Barr um, mono. So he had had mono twice before, and the third time he got it within a two year period. He was super sick. He was in bed for a couple of months. He was so sick. And um, that was when this decline gradually started, where he got better, but he was never 100%. And very, very gradually, he could not live. He was, he's a musician and music producer. He could not lift an amp. And then he couldn't lift a mic stand. And then he couldn't play guitar. And then he couldn't even, you know, play piano, which just takes this, you know, Mm -hmm. but you're holding your arms up. And he just, it was shocking to us. And we kept, uh, you know, taking him to doctors saying, why can't he do anything? But it was very gradual. And I think that if uh, people stopped the progress very early Mm -hmm. with correct treatment, uh, they wouldn't become bed bound like my son. And Gail, what was life, Gail, Galen? Uh, what was life like <laughs> left an end off like there. for you before you became a full-time caretaker for James? I know that you said in your bio that you also care for other of your children who have uh, serious conditions. I had. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was, I, I, I kind of wanted to put that out there as experience mm-hmm. that I'm not new to dealing mm-hmm. with doctors and hospitals, but I was um, working from home. 
uh, down in beautiful Beaufort, South Carolina. So much nature. I mean, you look up and you see eagles and blue herons flying overhead, just walking your dog. I mean, it's gorgeous here. And um, I was uh, living alone for the first time in my life. I raised six kids by myself, supported them by myself, had cared for these other people, cared for my father in hospice and his wife when he died. And I did all of that. So here I was finally, you know, living the life. And that only lasted about nine months. Wow. Uh, And I I found you on TikTok, as you know. And in TikTok, you mentioned that you and James were talking about his health and the comorbidities that come with time when you have MECFS. Is there a timeline of deterioration that is typical for MECFS? Uh, I mean, like you're, you're saying that in the beginning it was gradual, but is there a, a timeline that they yeah. recognize? I haven't heard of a recognized timeline, but I can speak to James and to people that I've encountered online. Mm-hmm. For them, it really takes time. Uh, yeah, it's not consistent. Some people get the worst symptoms immediately. I mean, two weeks after they have COVID, all of a sudden they're bed bound. And it stays that way with everything, pots, everything. James, it took the 10 years. He wasn't, we weren't really terrified until he started getting those comorbidities. For example, the uh, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, where you get dizzy when you raise your head. Uh, He had a lot of vertigo, a lot of dizziness, all these things combined with the severe fatigue were very shocking for us. We weren't, you know, we had no clue what was happening and we were shocked doctors didn't care. They mm-hmm. said it, it doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with him. So wow. with wow. him, it took and, about and 10 years. And we have years. spoken, okay. And we, we have spoken with others um, with living with this condition. And one of the individuals we spoke with was like an Olympic athletic person, um, a swimmer, like a, a known swimmer. And she said it was just like all of a sudden it went from she was, you know, absolute top of her game. Ready to go to the Olympics. Right. To not being able to do anything. anything. And it, it, it is it's surprising. So like you said, it could be yeah. it, it could, could be gradual. Could, it, right. Could be sudden. Right. Instant. Right. Well, right. That's, a that's shame. right. Yeah. yeah. Not so, enough research. No, you're right. Right. Mm-hmm. How common is MECFS? Is it something that... Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yesterday, December 8th, an article came out citing the CDC coming up with a new number. And that number is 3.3 million in the U.S. Wow. 3.3 million. It's it's not rare, but Mm -hmm. it's not acknowledged, recognized, or treated appropriately. Okay, and maybe that was a good first step to um, you More know then research. right so that funding can be you know placed in the national health. again and we've talked about this yes. many times mm-hmm. before. This is one of those ones. It's it's not a visible right right disability. Right. If you, right. So if you it's can't in your see head. It, right, right. Yeah, and if if and yeah. if it's relatively yeah. new and it's not something your healthcare provider is familiar with, instead of saying I don't know, which is something that I. We hope more healthcare providers will be able to say they want to just immediately, yeah, possibly right. label it with something. Um, what what yeah. symptoms are the most worrisome right now? And what, if anything, helps ameliorate like some of your son's symptoms? His His worst symptom is something he calls brain pain or a brain crash. And this is when he has a strong neurological response to overstimulation. For example, loud noise, bright light, um, a very uh, stressful interaction of some kind. Uh, And his, for example, if he were to try to read like a page, Mm -hmm. he can read maybe a paragraph. But if you were to try to read a page, he'd be using uh, his mind, his brain, and uh and his brain goes into this state uh, where it just feels like um, it's being, he described it as if you're wearing a, a football helmet, let's say, and someone is hammering it. Mm-hmm. 
and your whole head is feeling mm-hmm. like bruised. Mm-hmm. He said, that's what it feels like. It's not like a bolt. Like I've had really bad uh, tension headaches where it felt like a bolt of lightning, mm-hmm. you know, like into my temple. It's not like that. It's like this dull overall throbbing pain that is consistent, not just when the hammer hits, but it just stays. Mm-hmm. And uh, recently I've seen the SPECT. I don't know if you saw my uh, yeah, TikTok. Right, I saw that one. The imaging that shows the brain, that it is in the brain. Mm-hmm. Yes. And these doctors that say it's in your, you know, fantasy world, uh, it's it's just terrible. And then the second one, which is very terrifying for us and is brand new, is something called gastroparesis. Mm-hmm. It's another one of these comorbidities where his body has started to reject eating. Mm-hmm. He uh, he can't eat. He takes a bite of food and he just gags on it. Even though he's hungry, his stomach is growling. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't have any appetite. Right. And it's a neurological thing, mm-hmm. again. And um, the only thing that helps this uh, horrible condition for him right now is smoking hemp. Okay. None of the medications his specialist has pre- prescribed so far have done anything. And we've got one that's $500 a month out of pocket. Wow. We're trying. He's been on it for two, three weeks. Nothing. Mm-hmm. So um, it's pretty scary. Well, he doesn't want a beating tube. Do, it's the last thing you want. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I, I'm we right just there with them. We with someone. Right there with them. Um, and her, 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 her um, handle is stoned zebra about gastroparesis and and can- and the fact and that cannabis, cannabis helps yeah. her mm-hmm. um in order yeah yeah and and it helps yeah. yeah i mean i i'm a proponent so i'm glad that you live in an area that you can that, that allows that your yes. son allows that yeah. no 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 oh. no it's not legal not even medically in south oh. carolina we get oh, oh. something very very tamped down called okay. thca which is okay. not regular marijuana Right. The the version that he gets is basically hemp, and he has to smoke like two or three joints of it to be able to eat a meal. And he hates it. He hates it because he's not enjoying a high. He's just right. trying to be able to eat. So mm. it's a nightmare. Yeah. Sorry about that for sure. Did uh, did yeah. did the healthcare team have to run any tests to arrive at any of the diagnoses? I know he's got several. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, the ME, they have something called a NASA, N-A-S-A, a a lean test. Um, The specialist at Mount Sinai in New York did this, and they monitor your heart rate and everything while you're standing up, and they see how you respond to being vertical. And uh, it was grueling for him because at that point, he was already 90% bed bound, but he went through it. Mm They ran so many blood tests and urine tests and everything, and they gave him an MRI. So it's a differential diagnosis where they're ruling out, right. you know, MS, Lyme's. Um, I mean, you list everything. <laughs> Well-meaning people are mm-hmm. constantly saying to me, have you checked mold? Have you checked this? Yes. Believe me, when your son is bed bound, mm-hmm. you test everything. Right. And um, he doesn't have any of those things. He just has the ME. And, you know, the comorbidities, there are tests that they can do, but some of them are not worth doing because they are so stressful to him. Sure. So we go by the symptoms. Okay. So, Galen, before James received his diagnosis, had you ever heard of ME or CFS before? (laughs) Nope. Okay. No, never. And when he brought it up that he had found it online, Mm -hmm. we laughed it off. We said, if you found it online, it's hacks and, uh, you know, it's woo woo. Right. Um, but when he got that serious, mm-hmm. we had to say, look, you know, this doctor is telling us to commit you. We're going to listen to you. And we looked into it ourselves and, you know, oh my God, the CDC, you know, everybody was acknowledging mm-hmm. it. What the hell was wrong with the doctors? Mm-hmm. Right. So you er, uh, earlier mentioned about how common it is or how not uncommon it is. Do you have any of your friends or any family, uh, or is James the only one with uh, with this? He's the only one uh, in our immediate uh, circle that has it. Of course, we've met many friends. Sure. And um, I will say that, you know, back through history, they've been, you know, they've been looking at this actually since the 1800s, calling it different mm-hmm. things. But um, when we say that it's, you know, 3 million, that's pretty common. 
I think what's going on, though we don't have anybody in our family, is that um, people are not really, you know, coming out of the closet with it because people laugh them off and right. tell them that they're lazy, just do it. What the hell's the matter with you? I get tired too. Mm -hmm. This is what they face, and they don't want to face that stigma. Sure. Understood. That's a shame. Understood. Yeah, absolutely. Now that we have discussed the basics, I think our listeners have a better understanding, hopefully, of this condition. In order to better serve our guests and listening audience, we are now working as an affiliate with a major medical supply warehouse located right here in the United States. You will find our affiliate links on our website. Our goal is to tailor specific medical supplies and equipment based on individual not based on individual diagnoses to make it less stressful than looking through an entire catalog for what you might need. We are open to your suggestions and will adjust our offerings based on what you, our guests and listeners, find helpful. Thank you, Ron. Galen, as a caregiver, how do you find time for yourself and avoid burnout? Well, at first, I didn't know what the hell was happening, and it was so serious. Uh, we, my kids flew down from New Jersey. We were scrambling to find help, and the caregivers that we were finding through care.com, etc., had never heard of anything so severe. They, they didn't want to come. They would come and I would say, you know, you can't really talk to him because mm -hmm. he's extremely sensitive to sound. And they would say, well, then forget it. You know, I mean, it was, it was really rough. But we finally, I don't know how many months it took, I finally did find caregivers. And uh, when somebody is with my son, I am able to take a break. Sometimes mm -hmm. all I do is sleep. I actually got sick myself uh, because of all that stress in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I was working full time when I first started to take care of him because I work from home. And, you know, being up all night with him because his sleep is totally unpredictable. And he sleeps two hours at a time. He sleeps around the clock and is awake around the clock. So I got sick and I'm actually on disability myself now. But, um, you know, so getting those caregivers early, I would recommend to everybody, don't wait until you get like me and you just get sick, you know, immediately jump on getting caregiver support. That's great advice. Yeah. And you got them through care.com? Is that what? Actually, I ended up, um, I did it first, but then I ended up um, using the uh, Medicaid, he got disability okay, and Medicaid offers caregivers. So that's really where we ended up. And um, it was hit and miss. I mean, like I said, we went through a lot of them. Uh, but the one that I have right now is actually a friend of mine okay. who uh, saw what I was going through. And she had done this herself in the past. Um, but she signed on with one of the Medicaid uh, care providers and uh, she works through them. So, okay. Uh, also too, um, how is your human services out there in South Carolina? And the reason I'm asking is I work for human services here in Illinois and they offer programs to assist people. So again, different state, but I'm sure they have similar services. We have, uh, because of the way uh, South Carolina is, the types of people that you run into in that kind of a service area are voluntary organizations. Government provided support is not very strong for us. There is uh, an organization called South Carolina House Calls, and they provide nurse practitioners to come to the home, okay. which is huge because he's home head, you know, bed bound. Mm -hmm which is great. And they prescribe and, you know, just kind of keep an eye on basic needs. He has a specialist out of state, but um, that's great. But in terms of, uh, you know, when I needed a ramp, everybody said, um, you know, call this, call that. Mm -hmm. There's grants. Everything was backed up for years. There was absolutely no way to get any services. So um, I had to do a GoFundMe, you know, Mm -hmm. put my hat out, you know, begging for help. And I got a ramp mm -hmm. that way. Well, I'm glad you were able to do that. And 
Yeah, you took find the an innovative to way to do it, yes. do it rather yeah. than having to wait for yeah. forever. Right. Yeah. And and um, what role? Well, I guess I have two questions. What has filled the void? Because James went from having his focus, and I'm guessing his joy in life were mu- was music for a long time. Yes. So what is yes. what has helped fill that void? And did he have to um, grieve for that loss? Yeah. And then... Yeah, the, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. So when James lost his ability to make music, he mm-hmm. did feel absolutely adrift. You know, what is the point of living if I can't do anything meaningful, anything that defines me as a person? He had been a musician since he was 14. He had, uh, he was just at the beginning of a career with music. One of his songs that he wrote and produced and a young lady sang was uh, in the opening and two of songs were in the opening and closing credits of one of Burt Reynolds' last films called uh, Apple of My Eye. And, um, you know, he was just beginning. So Mm -hmm. losing that was traumatic and we all grieved so badly. And what he ended up doing, two things. One, he started playing music in his mind, uh, Mm -hmm. singing in his mind, replaying Sade or Miles Davis or anybody that he loved because he'd been listening to music, like I said, since he was 14. He would just play songs in his mind and listen to them as if he had headphones on and he could listen, which he was unable to do. Then uh, he discovered in, um, I think it was July of 2020, that he could use talk to text. He couldn't really use his phone, but he could talk softly at his phone. And he started writing poetry. And this is similar to song lyrics. And he just wrote his first poem and he took off and he was writing like five poems a day. And I ended up publishing a hundred poems of his by October of that year, just a few months later. And that was really helpful. He got He was able to get on Instagram and, you know, he had more than 10,000 people following his JS lyrical poetry page, which is such a validation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was really, it saved him really, I'd say to do this. Instagram shut him down, accused him of fraud and we couldn't fight it. So that was really sad. He Uh lost all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Instagram, so cruel. But um, in any event, uh, he he was he did find a creative outlet, and that was really good. Well, that, and, that is good. Yeah. Yeah. And and are you able to um, assist him, or is he able to do um, any exercises or anything in bed to prevent um, you know, like bed sores and atrophy? Right. And and then what role does um, nutrition play because of the gastroparesis? Um, you know, are you, is there anything you can do as far as, um, you know, like little meals throughout the day or what, what techniques are you using to help make sure he get meets his nutritional needs? That That's a good, those are both good questions. Uh, regarding the fact that he's been in the bed since 2020, he has always on good days, not every single day on good days, been able to turn himself to stretch his legs, um, So he does movements. Plus, when I toilet him in the bed, he raises his hips for me to put the chucks under him, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. those blue, you know, pads Mm -hmm. for him to go. And then he raises his hips again when I put his boxers on him. So he does, you know, those little movements all the time. And I think that's really helpful. Bed sores are not an issue for him, thank God. And when he's like, you know, functionally paralyzed, it doesn't last for more than a few days. So okay. we're good that way. As far as diet goes, um, he has had no sugar, no wheat for years now, and um, minimal dairy. He has certain dairy and not milk. But the uh, the gastroparesis does uh, need him to eat exactly as you said, less, more frequently, mm-hmm very difficult. Um, mm-hmm. We're getting the nutrition in him, mm-hmm. but uh, it's it's such a challenge. And this is new to us. It's only about three months. So, you know, we're still figuring it out and trying to work it out. If I can get one meal in him a day, that's like a meal, like chicken and rice with some mm-hmm. veggies, like a stir fry. If I can do that, I'll feel really good. Other things he might have is a little watermelon. 
you know, mm-hmm. I mean, sad to say, but uh, this is where we are. Um, he might have like, I'll give him a sandwich and I'll just have a few bites. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. So Galen, I understand you've written a book about your journey. Um, what was it that inspired you or why a book? Well, to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm about 90% done with it. I haven't finished mm-hmm. it. And I'm still struggling with the title because I feel like a title is key. I'm a marketer. Mm-hmm. I've mar- had a marketing career for 30 years. So I know how important words are. And I have a lot of copywriting under my belt. So I felt like it was perfect for me to kind of fill a gap in the market for this disease. We mm-hmm. have a lot of books, you know, that t- cover it in a general way. We have a lot of collections of stories about people's lives. And they say things like, you know, he's been bed bound for three years or whatever, but that's Mm -hmm. sort of too amorphous. We don't really get the, the nitty gritty picture. So here's a mother. I'm, I'm a mom and I haven't seen any books by mothers, Mm -hmm. uh, caregivers doing this. And I am able to shine that spotlight on what it is like for him and for me to deal with this the suffering, the sacrifice, mm-hmm. the isolation, um, the severe uh, contraction of life into one room. If people can't really comprehend it because if you've ever walked into the room of a person dying of cancer, and I, and I hate to bring that up because I know it might be traumatic for people to think about this, but mm-hmm. just bear with me for one moment because I've done this. Mm-hmm. They may have only weeks to live and you can go over to them and kiss their head and hold their hand and open their window and show them the birds. You can do all of this and give them, even with their morphine all the way up, give them love and help them to see something of nature. With James, when he's suffering, he can't tolerate another human being in his room. He can't tolerate being touched. He can't look out through a crack in the window, even at moonlight, light attacks his brain, sound, he can't listen to you talk to him and tell him that you love him. All you can say is yes, no. I mean, that's all you're allowed to say when this disease is really bad. And um, it's, it's just a torture that people can't comprehend. You can't wrap your head around it because we refer to experiences in our own past or those we know. There's nothing mm-hmm. like this when it becomes severe. So my mm-hmm. book will help people put our shoes on, walk a mile in our shoes. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, I think it's really needed. Yeah, it's Absolutely. definitely a different perspective. Yeah. And we look forward to yeah. um, to reading your work. Um, Thank when, you. you know, you'll, have to, you'll have to let us know when it comes out. Hopefully um, 2024. That's my hope. All right. We're rooting for you. <laughs> um, and Galen, what do you feel is the most... I mean, it sounds like a lot is misunderstood, but what do you feel is the most um, misunderstood aspect of this condition? I think what I just said is the most helpful for this question. And that is, if you don't have a reference, Mm -hmm. you can't understand it. You can't say, I get tired too. I had the flu. Oh yeah, I know what that's like. I had the flu. I couldn't get out of bed for a week. You don't know. You don't know because this is neurological and that brain pain, that aspect of the brain fog and the, and the feeling lost in your own head, it's terrifying. And Mm -hmm. uh, you weren't terrified when you had the flu. So um, I think, I think that's what I would say is the most difficult to understand is just how um, people talk about post exertional malaise, Mm PEM. That's one of the key features. I don't like the word malaise. We're not used to it. We don't use it. We don't know what it really stands for. So what I say is post-exertional collapse because these people literally collapse. They're in bed possibly for days after overexerting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Um, Galen, you mentioned in one of your videos that the risk for suicide is higher than average and in, I should say, in people, in patients that have ME. Uh, You personally, what do you do to help moderate James's symptoms of his depression? 
So the suicide rate is double the um, normal average. I, I read an article on it. And James, like everybody else that I know, does not want to die. He doesn't have any of the symptoms of depression in that he's full of ideas, of goals, of things he wants to do, of um, the life he wants to live. He doesn't feel like he has, um, like he, like people with depression in general uh, have this listless, you know, attitude, you know, oh, why bother, whatever. He wants to bother. And the problem is he can't. He can't act on any of the things he wants to do. And so I don't like calling it depression. I would say he doesn't want to live like this. He wants to live, but he doesn't want to live like this, suffering every single day, cut off from people, cut off from friends, cut off from interactions. So I would say what we do is he finds things like the poetry and with a new supplement he's taking, mm -hmm. he's able to use his computer. Uh, he has one of those, you know, wireless keyboards that's very lightweight and there's a computer screen at the end of his bed. He's able to do that now. So anything that he can do that helps him, you know, not feel completely helpless, useless, whatever. But um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to have a life in your bed. So, and the other thing that we do is, um, which I'm sure he's aware of, I make sure that I never, ever, and I mean this, ever complain about taking care of him. I, I want to make sure that he, that he never, he never sees me frustrated with him or upset or angry or um, in any way that he is a burden to me. No matter what he needs, I'm like on it. And I'm like, oh, that's okay. He's like, oh, I know you just went to bed and he has to have a bowel movement at two in the morning. And I'm like, hey, it's okay. I never walk in there with a grumpy face. I never act frustrated with him ever. And I think that that is really key to helping him have uh, a sense that it's okay. He doesn't okay. have to take his life to spare me some crazy burden of caring for him. So uh, for me, that is the second tool. The first tool is him having meaningful things. The second tool is me always being caring, patient, loving, generous, and kind always. All right. So I actually have a follow-up question to uh, something we talked about earlier, you, or you mentioned respite care. What do you do for yourself? Um, because it, it's a lot. I mean, you've got a lot going on, and, and like you say, you, you can't show frustration and all that, but <clears throat> you are human, and, and there's a lot. Uh, I guess the easiest way is the... Your plate is a platter. There's a lot on there. What do you do for yourself? Because you have to be able to take care of yourself so that you can take care of him. The first thing that I did when he became very sick and I was crashing and burning, literally, was I got a therapist. And I had virtual therapy for about a year. And that made all the difference in the world because one of the reasons I was burning out um, was because I was having traumatic responses. I had some trauma as a child, like I think everybody does. And by working through that, I was able to lighten my load. And all of a sudden, you know, him having these extreme needs and so many demands on me all of a sudden didn't feel like the end of the world. And the second thing that I do is once a month, I get a massage. And I have not a care in the world. It's while someone is with my son. I can't do this if he's not, you know, being cared for by a caregiver. Understood. But I get that massage. And then in the evenings, um, if he doesn't need me for a while, like let's say I just brought him a meal, I will sit in my bed and make jewelry. I design jewelry. And it's a beautiful hobby because I can, it's very small. It's not like doing a five-foot oil painting. I can just do it right on my lap. And um, it's creative. It makes me happy. 
That's nice. That's yeah, well, wonderful. Again, the key is you've got to be able to feel good with yourself in order to be yep. able to help somebody else. And that's so a important. big thing with caregivers. Yeah, a lot of people don't a lot of people <clears throat> don't understand that. I talk to a lot of parents. Yeah, I talk to a lot of parents who are terrified and taking care of severe ME kids for the first time. They reach out to me. And this is something really important that I tell them. If you drop dead, they have nobody. So what are you doing? Jumping like a nervous wreck every second they need something and killing yourself and burning yourself out. Figure out what can wait two minutes for you to go to the bathroom before you go and bring that water to them or whatever they need. When somebody is bed bound, your first response is everything is urgent. And I tell them, you, you just can't do that to yourself. You have to find a way to take care of yourself. Because if you literally die from stress over this, then what do they have? So you're taking care of them by taking care of you. Right. Makes, yeah. Nicely in, in, put. In, in my job, um, I, I work with students with severe physical disabilities. Um, oh, and and nice. I talk with their families yeah, I, I talk with their families a lot and the students about future care. And uh, again, just moving forward with all of this, as they get older, we as caregivers get older too. And then what's going to happen? So there's a lot of planning too for the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't really crossed that bridge yet. It's it's on our plate, me and all my other kids. I got five other kids. Uh, we all... You know, we approach it, we come up with little ideas, you know, moving him up to New Jersey where they are, et cetera. Yeah, and, and you never but know what right now, the future is going to bring, mm -hmm. you know, with with um, increased research funding and things of that nature. Right. Um, every day, right. you know, there's a new discovery and hopefully yep. you'll benefit from uh, future research and future treatment options. Or your son, you know, you and your family and, you know, your son. Okay. Are there any alternative therapies such as massage therapy, heat or ice? I can't picture acupuncture working uh, if he doesn't like too much stimulation. Is there anything that helps uh, any of his symptoms? Yes, he really benefits when his pain is bad uh, in his brain. I know this is going to sound weird. But he really benefits from, I have this like long beanbag type of thing that I put in the microwave okay. and put it around the back of his neck yep. and down his shoulders. And that warmth, for some reason, gives him relief. Yep. I Excellent. do massage him. I massage his shoulders, his back, his arms. Actually, I massage his whole body, but very gently. And, uh, you know, he lets me know if it's too much and, you know, he, he edits what I'm doing constantly, which, you know, if I had not had my therapy would have triggered me, mm -hmm. but, um, but I don't have no problem. Oh, you're doing it too hard. Oh, you're doing it too soft. I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. I'll, I'll adjust, you know, no problem. Right. And, uh, so, um, like I said, grateful for therapy. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> good, 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 good. Yeah. So Galen, what are some less apparent part of your life that have been affected by caring for James? Um, well, how has that affected you? Well, two things. One, my health was affected. Uh, at the beginning, because I didn't know what was going on and I didn't have support, I got sick. And I have uh, something called sarcoidosis and um, it got pretty bad. I, now I have from the you know, prednisone therapy, I have diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, sleep apnea, you know, a, a myriad problems for myself, which I, you know, the massage helps and the caregivers coming and letting me rest helps. Like I said, sometimes I just lie in my bed. I mean, a lot of time I just lie in my bed and that helps. And uh, I don't talk about those things at all. Uh, so I don't draw attention mm -hmm. to them. But um, on a personal level and for other caregivers, you have to know that if you are not getting the support you need 
these things can happen to you. And it's a, you know, lifelong sentence for me. I mean, I'm not going to all of a sudden be cured from sarcoidosis. It's chronic. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, your, your life is contracted. People want to take you to lunch. They want to hang out with you, um, you know, and you just can't do those things. The time that I would have spent being social, I spend writing my book, which I feel is a priority. One day, and I tell everybody this, my kids and everything, one day, I'll take a trip, I'll, you know, go out to dinner and have fun. You know, I mean, I'm not fatalistic at all about this. Okay. All That's right. a good attitude. Right. Yeah, and I think that answered my um, next question about uh, friends and family, because <laughs> um, that can be a challenge to have, to get assistance from them when, you know, yeah. Well, it kind of leads into mine, though, yes. uh, in general, how can, from your perspective, Gail, and how can uh, friends and family support uh, a full-time caregiver? I really believe in the bottom of my heart that there is not much they can do for the person with ME because it's so specialized and those restrictions of not being able to talk to them can be so difficult, but... Mm -hmm. We need to have the kitchen floor cleaned and mm -hmm. the laundry done and grocery shopping and, you know, errands and things like that, pick up things at the drugstore. I mean, the endless list of everyday, banal, common, rudimentary, fundamental life things, the, right. the practical things, those are, those are the places that as boring as it is, they can be really helpful and make a huge difference. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Galen, what advice do you have for someone who has recently been diagnosed with this condition? People use the term pacing. They use it liberally without explaining it. And we were told about pacing when he got his diagnosis at Mount Sinai. Okay, now you have, you know, you have to pace. We didn't know what that meant. Well, what is pacing? What does that mean? So the urgent message I have to anyone who even suspects they have this disease is to stop exerting yourself and do 80%, never 100%, 80% of what you could do. So if you pushed yourself or if you, you know, went to your limit, let's say that you could walk half a mile, mm -hmm. or let's say that you could stand for an hour. Well, you have to do 80% of that. Don't get to that point because then you're risking a crash, especially if there are other elements involved, maybe stress, maybe something emotional. Um, so all of this compounds to use up your energy envelope. And that's a term that I really like because it's, it's very easy to imagine that you've got a capacity and it's limited with ME. And if mm -hmm. you go to your full capacity, you are hurting yourself. So I'm not telling you you can't do anything because mm -hmm. if you're mild, there's plenty you could do. But I am saying that you have to watch it because pushing and crashing, which some people do and laugh about. Oh, yeah, I, I went to the mall and now I'm going to be in bed for two days. Ha, ha, ha. I'm paying the price. Oh, God, that is so irresponsible and foolish mm -hmm. because that is how you end up with a lower baseline and not able to go to the mall ever again. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's what I would say. So okay. it's okay to do what you're doing. Just don't push the limits. That's right. Okay. Well, Galen, before we wrap up this episode, we have been following your advocacy on TikTok. Are you on other social me uh, media platforms as well? And could you share your links with our listeners? Uh, sure. Um, so very simple to remember if you don't remember my name, Galen Warden. I have a website, severemecfs.com. Very easy to remember. There you will see um, all about me. There's a page about James. You'll see all about James. Uh, there's a page about his book where you can see um, people reading his poetry because he couldn't do it. And then under resources, so severemecfs.com slash resources, you will find 
um, a lot of links and PDFs to government literature, scientific research, peer reviewed that you can share with your family and friends. And the blog has um, some really great stuff about gurney transportation, toileting in the bed, just these practical things. Um, so you want that. And then I have an Instagram, which is also severe MECFS. That's the at, you know, severe MECFS, which James manages for me. I give him the content and he posts it uh, because I'm not good with Instagram. And I'm on Facebook, Galen Warden. I'm the only Galen Warden on the planet. So, if you, <laughs> you know, look for Galen Warden on Facebook. You'll see my Facebook, which is a private account. But I make everything about this topic public. I just don't have pictures of my grandchildren or whatever, you know, on there. All right. Well, thank you very much. So, Galen, thank you so thank much. You. For, thank you for joining our show today. Um, we look forward to reading your book in 2024. Yeah. For our listeners, if you have any questions or comments related to, day, to today's show, you can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Pinterest, TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, and always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new, new health care regime and never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard in this podcast. Till next week. Bye.